Hello students, this is Dr. Ways and welcome to your lecture on the accessory organs of the GI tract. First we'll start with the liver and notice that liver is uh, mostly in the left upper quadrant or if we're looking at it in terms of region, it's in the uh, left hypochondriac region and the epigastric region. Notice also that most of it is under the rib cage. So if you're trying to palpate for the liver, um, you'd have to put your hands underneath the rib cage to be able to feel it. But you could argue you could feel it here as well, but then consider you also have other organs such as the stomach sitting there as well, which might interfere with your ability to actually palpate the liver. So in physical exam lab, you'll learn techniques and how you can uh, palpate the liver and uh, see whether or not it's enlarged or if it's causing pain. So in terms of where it sits in the thoracic cavity, uh, notice that it is directly underneath the liver. In fact, there's very little space between the liver and the diaphragm. Where you do see a little bit of space is right here in what we call the subphrenic recess. In other words, underneath the diaphragm recess. Uh, and notice that it is anterior, this is posterior, and we can tell because the kidneys are right there. Um, so start using these cues to tell where you are in the body. Um, then of course we have our hepatorenal recess between the liver, uh, space between the liver and the kidney. The liver can be considered a gland, and if we consider it a gland because of the uh, substances it secretes, uh, it's technically the largest gland in the body. It's one of the largest organs in the body. And it has um, four lobes. Uh, here is the right lobe. Of course, I would be on the right side. Left lobe. And then if we look on the back side of the liver, we can see the quadrate lobe, okay, which is this little quadrangular shape. And we also see the caudate lobe right here. And caudate means towards the back or towards the tail. So it's a little piece towards the tail that is kind of a extension of the right lobe of the liver. It has two surfaces we should know about. The first is the diaphragmatic surface, of course, because it sits right on the diaphragm. And the other is the visceral surface, which is inferior. And of course, the visceral surface, remember visceral means organ, so it's sitting on the organs that are below it. And what organs are below it? Well, you'll have uh, the large intestines, small intestines, as well as the stomach. All right, as far as ligaments that hold it together and hold it to the abdominal wall, First, we have the falciform ligament, and that is the most prominent ligament that you'll see. And notice that it is uh, dividing the uh, right lobe from the left lobe. So it's this big ligament that you can see dividing the right lobe and the left lobe. And it also extends up here into the diaphragmatic surface, separating the liver from the diaphragm proper. And one more thing about that is the anterior portion that we see uh, is what actually connects the uh, liver to the anterior wall of the abdominal cavity. And one more structure that I want you to be familiar with from the, these pictures is something known as the porta hepatis. And you can see it here on the posterior aspect of the liver as well as the inferior aspect of the liver. And the porta hepatis is very similar to what we saw with the root of the lung. And remember with the root of the lung, that was where all of the bronchial bronchi as well as the arteries and veins and nerves are going into the lungs or out of the lungs and so here is a group of artery vein and cystic or bile ducts uh, that are coming out of the liver or going into the liver in case of the in the case of the artery so again that is known as the porta hepatis one of the liver's primary jobs is to produce bile. Uh, and when it produces bile, uh, the bile gets, uh, goes down into these, through these hepatic ducts, the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. And this duct system you should be familiar with. So the left and right hepatic ducts empty into the common hepatic duct, all right? And notice these are called hepatic ducts because they're coming from the liver. And then a lot of this bile ends up going into the cystic duct and the cystic duct comes is 
the duct that heads into the gallbladder. So uh, what the liver does is it concentrates and stores bile inside the gallbladder and then the gallbladder releases bile when it's needed by the digestive system. All right, so that you don't have a continuous flow of uh, bile from the liver. Although in people who do not have a gallbladder, uh, they do rely on a consistent flow of bile from the liver and that doesn't necessarily do them any harm. Okay, so um, from the cystic duct, uh, where the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct come together, then it forms what we call the common bile duct. Now one thing I want to point out is that the right and left hepatic ducts and the common hepatic duct are one way, so they're only going down towards the duodenum of the small intestine. The cystic duct is a two-way street. So, you know, you have to get bile in there to store it, but then you have to squirt bile back out so it can be used in digestive processes. So the cystic duct's a two-way duct. And then the common bile duct is one, should be one way. If there's reflux, then that can lead to some problems. Uh, but uh, it should be a one-way duct. And notice that it's going to be emptying into the duodenum of the small intestine. Uh, and it's going to form with a duct coming from the pancreas, the main pancreatic duct, uh, and then empty through a, an opening in the duodenum um, that we'll see later uh, to aid in the chemical digestion of food. And if we're specifically talking about bile, it aids in the chemical digestion of fats. All right, as far as the blood supply goes, notice here that you have the celiac trunk and then that's gonna branch off into the common hepatic artery and if we follow that up, where it branches off into the right hepatic artery, there's a small branch that comes off, and that's going to be your cystic artery. And that cystic artery is going to go supply blood to the uh, gallbladder. Uh, cystic means bag or bladder, so cystic artery would be the uh, artery that's supplying the gallbladder. Right now moving on to the pancreas, uh, remember the pancreas is both an endocrine and an exocrine organ. The endocrine function secretes insulin and glucagon that help regulate the glucose levels in your blood uh, and the amount of sugars that your uh, cells are taking up. Uh, but it, since this is anatomy class, <laughs> we're, we're not concerned about that. We're concerned with where it is and what it looks like in, uh, you know, how it's put together. So. Uh, the pancreas can be found in within the C-shaped loop of the small intestine, of the duodenum specifically, uh, nestled in there, uh, and it has four different parts to it. The head is the part that's going to be nestled into the C-shaped loop, and then that's going to give rise to the neck. The neck's going to be the next part, and notice that the neck is between the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery. Here would be the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, so that's where you'd find the neck, and then the body extends the rest of the way until you reach the very tip, which is the tail. Uh, now notice that the pancreas is posterior to the stomach, and the stomach here has been drawn uh, transparent so that you can see how the pancreas sits nestled behind it. Okay, and this is a really nice picture right here, and what it shows you is the pancreas, of course. And then this would be the pyloric region of the stomach, this area right here. And this would be the pyloric sphincter. All right, so this in blue right here would be the pyloric sphincter. Let me change to a different color. And so uh, once we get past that, then we're in the first, second, third, and fourth part of the, of the duodenum, otherwise known as the superior part, the descending part, the inferior part and the ascending part right here all right so those are the four regions and we said before that all of the chemical digestion uh, that get comes from other places gets put into the duodenum at the descending part or the second part of the duodenum all right and you can see that here because you have these two small ducts right here uh, known as the major duodenal papilla and the minor duodenal papilla uh, through which 
bile and pancreatic secretions get secreted into. So the major duodenal papilla uh, comes from a coalescing of the common bile duct and the main pancreatic duct, which open up into this thing called the hepatopancreatic ampulla, which is formerly known as the ampulla of Vader, Vater, rather. Um, and so you have bile getting secreted into here, but you also have all of the pancreatic juices getting secreted into there too, which are your major protein digesting enzymes, such as uh, trypsin, uh, you, amylase gets secreted in there, bicarbonate, as well as lipase. So all of your major pancreatic enzymes, uh, as well as bile is coming from this. And then this minor duodenal papilla which is also known as the uh, accessory duct of Santorini, um, only comes from the pancreas. So you only will have pancreatic juices being secreted from there. So you have a kind of a redundant duct system uh, getting pancreatic juices into the uh, second part, the descending part of the duodenum uh, to take part in chemical digestion of the food that just came from the pyloric region of the stomach. As far as the blood supply to the pancreas goes, uh, here this picture is a reminder of where the pancreas is located. Uh, specifically pay attention to the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery. And then go over to this and this is the whole picture flipped around. So you're looking at the posterior side of the pancreas uh, and here would be the celiac trunk and here would be the superior mesenteric artery and you notice that the pancreas is you know, nestled between there. And so the celiac trunk um, branches off into the common hepatic artery, the gastroduodenal artery, and notice the gastroduodenal artery has branches that go uh, around the pancreas and branch out and supply blood to the head and the neck of the pancreas. Whereas the uh, splenic artery that wavy one that we talked about, notice it has branches that are going directly to the pancreas, supplying the body and the tail with blood. All right, so it's the splenic artery and the gastroduodenal artery that has branching points that are supplying the pancreas itself with blood. And uh, those are coming from both the celiac trunk as well as you can see here from the uh, superior mesenteric artery. All right, we already covered the duct system in some detail already, but so this uh, should be pretty much a review for you. Uh, so here's a liver, and remember the liver is responsible for producing bile. So you have all of these uh, ducts that are producing bile and sending it into what we call the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. So you're seeing the uh, distal branches of that. And then they come together and form the common hepatic duct right here. All right, so We've retraced those steps, common hepatic duct, and then remember off to here we have the cystic duct, and remember the cystic duct goes to and comes from the gallbladder because that's a place for the liver to store bile, but it's also a place for the gallbladder to secrete bile into the common bile duct. All right, so the common bile duct, and that is a one-way duct, uh, and we see the cystic duct here and the common bile duct going down here, and then that duct empties into the hepatopancreatic ampulla along with the main pancreatic duct to secrete bile as well as pancreatic juices into the descending portion of the uh, duodenum. Now one more thing about this opening right here at the hepatopancreatic ampulla and the opening that we know as the major duodenal papilla, uh, we don't want things, juices, bile, pancreatic secretions constantly flowing into the duodenum. So there is a muscular uh, sphincter there called the sphincter of Adi, O-D-D-I, that should be a capital O, O-D-D-I, and that sphincter regulates uh, when juices flow from the Pancreatic, hepatopancreatic ampulla into the duodenum of the 
So I don't know about you, but I look at these pictures and every picture that I see of the gallbladder, you see that it is, uh, this, the cystic duct is going upwards, right? So my thought is, well, how does the bile go from the common hepatic duct and go upwards into the cystic duct and then down back into the gallbladder? It turns out that the walls of the uh, cystic duct are muscular and they undergo peristalsis very similar to what you see in the uh, the intestines you know peristalsis are those wave-like contractions and that takes the bile and physically pushes it up into the gallbladder and then of course you see the gallbladder is going down so then it by gravity can just fall into the gallbladder then of course we know the gallbladder also has muscle because it's if it's going to squeeze juice out of it, it has to have muscular contractions so then it will squeeze back this way and that peristalsis will continue to push bile back down here when you get the uh, when the gallbladder gets a signal to contract and push the bile in the opposite direction. The spleen is another organ that is in the abdominal cavity and it has a blood supply that is connected to the rest of the digestive system but it itself does not particularly play a role in digestion of in the digestion acti digestion activities like the rest of the digestive organs and accessory organs do uh, but what we do know is that the spleen does destroy red blood cells when they get the signal and will recycle those parts so from that perspective that would be a form of uh, auto digestion where you're uh, taking stuff that's already in your body digesting it down and then recycling the parts back to where they need to go so the spleen sits remember we said just to the left side of the stomach and uh, posterior to it right here and it's under the rib cage so when you want to uh, palpate for the spleen you're going to have to uh, get your fingers under the rib cage and in people with normal size spleens you're generally not going to feel it you're only going to feel it when you have an enlarged spleen what we term splenomegaly uh, that happens under certain disease conditions um, and you know this is uh, the left the left side of the abdominal cavity up under the ribs is where you would feel for it so uh, that's what this palpation means all right and here's another picture showing you where the location is of course this is posterior anterior and this is the left side of the body so what we're doing is we're looking uh, up into the person uh, so the inferior part is facing towards us and the posterior is facing away from us so the spleen is right here uh, lateral and posterior to where the stomach is located all right like other organs that are very similar in structure we have an indented region of the spleen uh, which is known as the hilum and you notice that with the hilum you have arteries going in and veins coming out so uh, we're going to see a similar kind of setup with um, we saw that with the lungs, the lungs have a hilum, kidneys are going to have a hilum, and lymph nodes also have a hilum. So a hilum is kind of a, a generic term for a, an indentation in an organ where uh, major veins, arteries, nerves, and lymphatics and or lymphatics are going into or coming out of. So uh, with the blood supply to the spleen, uh, remember it is this splenic artery of course that's going to come up here and then give the branch off and give the spleen its blood supply but then it's also going to uh, have a blood supply coming from the left gastromental artery so that's kind of an anastomosis a redundant blood supply uh, just in case one of those gets blocked off the spleen is still able to uh, receive a blood supply from an, another source all right, so just a review uh, again, like we did with the organs of the abdominal cavity. Uh, the arterial blood supply, you know, you have the celiac trunk here and then the superior mesenteric artery. Uh, the branch of the celiac trunk, splenic artery, going to the spleen, uh, sending blood into this left gastromental artery. 
although there might be some pushback to go from that into the spleen as well, depending on pressure gradients. Um, the common hepatic artery, the gastroduodenal artery, uh, branching off and giving rise to uh, branches that will also help uh, feed the head and the neck of the pancreas, whereas the splenic artery is also feeding the body and the tail of the pancreas. Um, up here, remember we have the uh, common hepatic artery, and then the hepatic artery proper, and then the left hepatic artery, which then branches off into the, I'm sorry, the right hepatic artery, which branches off into the gallbladder uh, for the cystic artery. And then the reverse side of the uh, pancreas, uh, just showing you the uh, artery, arterial blood flow that we talked about over here, so I'm not going to go over that again. But use these pictures to your advantage. Again, I would recommend drawing these pictures out and labeling them and knowing where the blood flow is actually going to because this is one area uh, that is going to be really important to know and for sure you'll be tested on it. All right, venous drainage is a little more complicated than the arterial system and that is because of this concept of the portal vein and we discussed that when we discussed uh, in the last lecture about uh, venous drainage coming from the abdominal organs so everything that gets absorbed by the small intestine has to go through the liver first all right so uh, where that supply is going to come from is you have the inferior mesenteric vein right here and the superior mesenteric vein coming right here and those are going to come from uh, the small and large intestines right here. So again, the inferior mesenteric vein is going to drain the same regions that the inferior mesenteric artery supplies, and the superior mesenteric vein is going to drain the same regions that the superior mesenteric artery supplies. All right, and both of these are going to come together, and of course you have a branch coming from the spleen, the splenic vein, and they're going to merge into the hepatic portal vein. All right, and so you see this here as well, the uh, spleen, splenic vein, the inferior mesenteric vein, and the superior mesenteric vein all coming to form the portal vein, which then branches off and goes to uh, smaller and smaller branches within the liver. All right, and what this is doing is it is allowing all of the blood that's coming from digestive organs and brand uh, that's nutrient rich and filtering it through the liver uh, so that the liver can process whatever needs to get processed before it gets put back into normal circulation all right so that's the job of this portal vein is to take all of that blood and push it through the liver filtration system and then uh, all of those uh, that blood that has been filtered will then exit the, uh, and we're over here right now, exit the liver through the hepatic vein proper. And the hepatic pain, vein proper, notice, empties into the inferior vena cava. And then, of course, that goes right back to the heart, pumped up to the lungs, and then pumped up to the rest of the body. And so here's another picture showing that venous drainage. Uh, again, let's point out the superior mesenteric vein. Uh, the inferior mesenteric vein. Notice that the inferior mesenteric vein doesn't directly go to the portal vein. It goes into actually the splenic vein. So those two merge together to go into the hepatic portal vein. And then the hepatic portal vein travels upwards uh, and then of course branches out. Uh, leaves the liver through the hepatic vein or hepatic veins rather uh, and into the superior or inferior vena cava up to the heart. All right, as far as lymphatic drainage is concerned, uh, take note that lymph nodes are named after the organ that they drain. So you'll have hepatic nodes, for example, or the blood, or they're named according to the blood vessels that they lie near. So you'll have uh, superior mesenteric nodes near the 
uh, superior mesenteric artery. You'll have celiac nodes near the celiac trunk. All right, and again, these make sense to have there because, again, the uh, digestive system is, you know, one full of uh, normal flora, bacteria, uh, that we're supposed to have, but if that gets out, it can cause problems, and everything that's in the digestive system has already come from the outside, which is already foreign to uh, your body. So you want to have these lymph nodes acting as sentinels to uh, monitor anything that may get out of the digestive system and into the circulation, or actually take care of it before it gets to the circulation. All right, and in this picture, notice that all the lymph nodes travel in one direction. They're all traveling up towards uh, this cisterna chyli, or the child cistern. And once they're in the child cistern, that's where they will enter the thoracic duct and then uh, empty into the uh, venous drainage at their appropriate location, uh, which is typically the uh, left subclavian vein. All right, now for the innervation. Uh, innervation with the digestive system is a, a little bit different than what you'll see in other, other organs. Um, the digestive system has what we call both intrinsic innervation and extrinsic innervation. So when they say that the digestive system or the gut has its own nervous system, this intrinsic innervation is what it's talking about, is what they're talking about. And so first of all, just to remind you uh, that uh, along the entire alimentary canal from the stomach all the way down to the anus, uh, there are uh, four layers to the wall. Uh, in each one of those areas so and the same four layers exist so you'll have the and we're gonna work from the outside in usually I like to work from the inside out but uh, the outside in you'll have this serosa layer okay and the serosa layer is the outermost layer that's connected tissue connecting it to uh, um, other structures in the abdominal cavity including the parietal peritoneum I'm sorry the visceral peritoneum uh, and then we have two muscle layers. We have a longitudinal muscle layer, all right? And the longitudinal muscle layer, you can see here, you can see the fibers are running in a longitudinal direction. And remember, this is smooth muscle, all right? So the smooth muscle cells, uh, you know, they have this spindle shape. Um, those spindles are running in this direction, whereas in the layer underneath or below that, uh, you'll have the spindles running in this direction or a uh, circular direction around the around the tube. So uh, longitudinal muscle layer and then the circular muscle layer and in between those is where we will have our myenteric plexus. All right, anything that begins with M Y E M Y in fact means muscle. So my muscle enteric. Uh, uh, intestines, so the myenteric plexus, and it's just a group of uh, nerve cells and connections that help to regulate digestive system activities. All right, and in this case, uh, since they're between the two muscular layers, they're going to regulate uh, muscular contractions within the uh, alimentary canal. And when we think of muscular contract contractions, we think of uh, mixing in the stomach, and we think of peristalsis, which is moving things along in those wave-like contractions. And it's this myenteric plexus that will uh, assist in local control of those particular functions. All right, and it can do it without any inside influence. So it can do it without the influence of the uh, parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system. All right, moving inward just below this circular layer, now we have the submucosa, all right, the submucosa. And the submucosa is uh, the second layer outside of the mucosa, which is the innermost layer right here. So the mucosa, that's what actually comes in contact with uh, whatever has been eaten and is moving through the digestive system. So the, uh, the uh, mucosa 
uh, provides that function, and the mucosa is where uh, secretion of substances were, would occur, uh, if we're talking about the stomach, uh, where absorption of things would occur, if we're talking about the, uh, the jejunum and the ileum of the small intestine, and so on. So if you notice, between the circular layer of the, of the tube and the uh, submucosa, we have another set of uh, nerves uh, known as the submucosal plexus, the submucosal plexus. And the submucosal plexus is going to be more involved with uh, secretion activities. So it'll stimulate secretion of things in the alimentary canal uh, when needed. And again, this is going to be totally local control as opposed to being influenced by the, the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system. Now that's not to say that the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system don't interact with the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus because they do, but um, they're not always necessary. The gut can, uh, can regulate itself. All right, so then you have the extrinsic innervation and the extrinsic innervation is going to come from the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And remember, parasympathetic in the digestive system uh, ramps up activities, all right? So anything in the digestive system, when you have more secretion and more muscular contraction, that's going to be guided by the parasympathetic nervous system. But when you have less muscular contraction and less digestive secretions, that's going to occur via the sympathetic nerve system. And keep in mind that this is the exact opposite of what happens everywhere or most everywhere else in the body. All right, for example, your um, blood vessels, the blood vessels in your body, uh, for those that contract, it's a sympathetic nervous system. For those that relax, it's the parasympathetic nervous system. Again, in the digestive system, it's the exact opposite. So where do these nerves come from? Well, of course, if you're coming from the uh, sympathetic nervous system, they're coming from these uh, sympathetic chain ganglia that are running alongside uh, the vertebral column. Uh, and, you know, are coming from branches that come from the spinal cord, but uh, directly coming from these uh, chain ganglia. All right. So... Uh, when they're coming from there, we have our, they're called spl splanchnic nerves, and we have our thoracic splanchnic nerves, lumbar splanchnic nerves, um, that are providing input into what we know as uh, these plexuses. Plexuses are just interconnections of different nerves that are combining and resorting and sending them off to where they need to go. All right, so... You'll also have input from the uh, sacral ganglia um, that are going to the pelvis, uh, which will also uh, take part with the uh, function of the of the of the urinary bladder and the urinary system uh, in that area. And so this is just a continuation of sympathetic innervation, and just to point out. Uh, the celiac plexus, which uh, combines, sor again, sorts and combines uh, nerve fibers coming from different areas of the sympathetic chain ganglion. And so we'll see that here with the aortic plexus, right here, and the uh, superior hypogastric plexus here. All right, so... Um, you know, you don't have to know how these sort and combine. You don't have to know all the nitpicky details of that, but be aware that there are uh, different plexuses and notice that they run along the length of the aorta. Um, and of course they're named according to where they're located, celiac, aortic, directly on the aorta, and superior hypogastric, which would be down here uh, below where the aorta branches into the common iliac arteries. Now the parasympathetic innervation is what we really uh, want to know about because uh, remember again that the parasympathetic nervous system is what ramps up digestive activities. So uh, the parasympathetic nervous system is wired so that you have your ganglia 
far away from where the spinal cord is, where the sympathetic, the ganglia are very close to the spinal cord. Um, so they're a little farther away. Um, so they're not going to come from sympathetic chain ganglia. They're going to come from other areas, uh, specifically vagal trunks are going to come down and you notice they're coming down where the esophagus exits from the thoracic cavity through the diaphragm into the abdominal cavity down and they're going to participate in uh, forming the plexuses in the celiac trunk um, and those are going to innervate the foregut and the midgut, all right? And uh, remember, we talked about what the foregut and the midgut are in the previous lecture, so go back and remind yourself about uh, what areas those are. And then the pelvic splanchnic nerves are, uh, are actually parasympathetic, um, and even though they come from uh, very close to the spinal cord, and so that, that makes them kind of unique. And again, they're going to innervate regions in the uh, in the pelvic area, and come from uh, notice the uh, sacrum. All right, remember back when we did the lungs, and we can divide the lungs into different regions. Well, the liver also has different divisions itself, and um, you don't have to know these divisions for our purposes, but. You may come across a time where you do need to know that the liver can be divided into different divisions. And these divisions are based upon the distribution of bile ducts as well as hepatic vessels. All right, so we're not going to point out which are hepatic vessels and which are bile ducts, uh, but be aware that there are different segments of the liver. In fact, if you uh, count through all of these, you'll notice that there are eight segments and the importance of segmenting the liver like this has more to do with um, when you undergo liver surgery, liver resection surgery, and they want to know uh, which areas to cut out, what they're connected to. So, uh, you know, in general, you're not going to have to know this, but if you get into surgery uh, and you're doing liver resections or studying with liver resections on a patient, like which part do we want to take out and why, uh, then this would be uh, good information to know.